Hi, and thank you for tuning into my video. If you would like to learn more about child witnesses, then you've tuned into the right place. My name is Dr. Kamala London, and I've spent about the past 25 years studying nothing but child witnesses. I'm a developmental psychologist, and my area of research is in children's cognitive and social development, but then particularly how we can tailor our forensic proceedings to best suit child witnesses. And the reason why I decided to make this video is that I get a lot of phone calls from attorneys asking me for information about child witnesses or asking me to evaluate their cases to act as an expert witness. But uh, I can't take very many cases. I'm a busy uh, professor and, and mother. Uh, I have two dogs and have a new addition to the family of a horse. And so needless to say, I can't take very many cases. So I thought perhaps a venue like this would be a nice way to convey some information to people who were looking to hear more about child witnesses. So this is my first video, and if I find that people in fact watch it and like it, then I will put some more up and possibly my doctoral students will put some up as well. If you don't wanna hear more about child witnesses, this would be a good time to um, simply tune out and look elsewhere for what you're looking for. So just a quick overview regarding children is my goal for this video. And I'll expand on other topics uh, in future videos would be my plan. So just regarding child witnesses, where I would like to start, can children give accurate testimony in the courtroom? And how can we get accurate testimony from children? Um, children often are witnesses to crimes. Often they may be the only witness to crimes. They also frequently testify in family court where they will provide information regarding whether you know, they'll end up spending a certain amount of time with their, their mom or their dad. But suffice it to say, children often are witnesses. Sometimes they may be the only surviving witness to a homicide, for example. And we're left with this issue of how can we interview children in order to promote their reports. Can they even give accurate reports? Again, is what I'll start with today. And the answer to that question, or when, at what point in development can we trust um, children as witnesses? The, um, the, the quick answer to that is around age four. So at about age four, um, or even three, children are beginning to have enough vocabulary where they can provide information. But I will say that three and four year olds are very difficult to interview because they have difficulties providing logical, coherent narratives. And also they often talk about things that um, simply don't make much sense when you're asking them to recount a, a recent story, for example. But what I will say is that from a really young age, even three, four, five-year-olds, preschoolers can in fact um, recount, they can encode, they can retrieve information about things that happened to them. I know a really early issue and concern in the child witness field is can children differentiate fantasy from reality? And I will say there that the answer is yes. Um, from a very young age. One of my favorite studies in developmental psychology was conducted by a researcher named David Estes, and he basically conducted a task where he uh, would just ask children about things that they were actually touching or things that they were imagining. And even three and four year olds know that they can't actually eat an imagined cookie. Rather, it's just simply in their mind. Uh, but despite that children can distinguish fantasy and reality, there are many, many peaks and valleys 
in children's abilities to give accurate testimony. And so it really falls on us, the adults, the forensic interviewers, the attorneys, the guardian ad litem to handle children correctly. So children, are they competent? Can they be competent witnesses? Absolutely. Three and four year olds are going to provide much less compared to older children, but even again, a four year old can provide an accurate information. So in the subsequent videos that I plan to post and elaborate on, what I will argue uh, that is that the research indicates that it can be quite difficult to distinguish and to figure out whether a child has been maltreated. Now I've worked on cases involving homicides where we have a child who's a surviving witness, where there's physical evidence. The cases that I'm most often called upon though are cases of child sexual abuse. And the reason for that is that in the vast majority of those cases, there is no physical evidence. And so the only evidence in the case at all tends to be the child's report. And so if we have a child who is reporting and making allegations, or perhaps just a parent who's concerned about their child's behavior and they're worried that perhaps they could have been sexually abused while say visiting their, uh, the mom's ex-husband, um, what can we do? So there are really are two possibilities. Either the child was in fact abused or the child was not abused. And what I'll discuss in future videos is that um, we really don't have crystal balls where we can readily figure out with the child that we're dealing with, were they abused or were they not abused? But, I mean, that's the ultimate issue. That's what we want to know, and that's what either the judge or the jury will have to decide. So, what can we do? Well, what you'll see is we're going to go downward from abuse and no abuse, and we're going to look at what are the different possibilities. If, in fact, the child was abused, how do they tend to tell and disclose to other people? Um, to what extent would we expect them to deny and to recant? And in the case where the child was not abused, how can we best figure that out? Um, and what are the questioning methods and, and the contacts that would get that non-abused kid to in fact report it? So just a quick history about me. I'll mention that, again, I've been studying the field for about 25 years. I've published quite a bit of research on this topic of interviewing children. And, and I actually first became interested in this topic when I was in um, undergraduate college uh, for about three years. Back in 1990, I started um, working at a police department. I was a college level intern person, and I was actually planning on being a lawyer. And I took a lot of police reports and I became fascinated by what I would see the different ways of how people would respond to my questions based on how I put the question forward. And so if I would say to people, what did he look like? It would lead to major differences from say asking them how tall was he or was he taller than you or was he shorter than you? And I just became absolutely fascinated in the field. So rather than going on and becoming a police officer or an attorney, I decided to get my doctorate in developmental psychology with a large emphasis in research methods and statistics out at the University of Wyoming, where I really enjoy the mountains. Um, following that point, I did a four-year postdoctoral fellowship uh, at the Johns Hopkins School of Medicine where I worked with a wonderful, wonderful woman and scholar named Maggie Brock. And we began to investigate eyewitness testimony in children with autism and intellectual disabilities and, and anxiety disorders. And so this again is my introductory video. I know that I haven't provided a whole lot yet regarding the different areas, um, again, that fall underneath this, how can we get a child to tell if they've been abused and 
under what circumstances and context do children lie and uh, what are the, the questioning methods and circumstances that put social influence on children uh, that end up leading to false statements from children and, and how good do these false statements look? I think that's another very, very important issue and question. And so I don't want to make this video too long. I will go ahead and, and end here. If you do like the video, please like it. And if, again, people, attorneys or researchers in the field find this helpful, I will continue posting on different topic areas as well as on my studies as they, can, as they come out. Um, my most recent study I'll talk about um, next time as well is on the use of dogs in the courtroom. Uh, how, to what extent do dogs facilitate communication in people or provide emotional support is one example of the work that we're doing in my lab here at the University of Toledo in Ohio. So again, thank you for tuning in and more soon. Take care.